This really is a pleasure for me. It's my first time at Lehman, uh, and, and to be able to uh, be a part of a, a session with not only one of my really close friends, but also someone who's driven and provided so much information and knowledge to this industry and Dr. Brum, this really is a, a privilege for me. So as, as Mike alluded to, um, you know, kind of the idea of understanding and trying to estimate how floor space impacts finishing pig performance or pig performance in general is, is something we've been trying to understand for a long time. Uh, you know, in 1983, Cornegay uh, and Nodder published the first set of prediction equations to estimate how floor space impact impacted nursery, grower, and finishing pig performance. Uh, in 1993, um, Dr. Brum's group uh, with the NCR 89 committee uh, did a few studies and also developed a set of prediction equations. And then the work that uh, Dr. Ganyu and, and, and Mike worked on uh, 10 years ago um, has also been, been published. So some things that we've got to think about. Mike already touched on it. We're growing pigs to heavier weights today than we ever have before, right? So space is more important to us. The other thing is, is that we've got sow farms kicking out more pigs than we've ever had before. So that puts a lot more pressure on, on our space utilization. What else is happening? Well, something that we do differently in the last 15 years compared to previously is that typically we're performing some type of marketing events, right? We're gonna go into a barn and we're gonna take a percentage of the heaviest pigs out of the population, send them to the packer, and leave the lower, lighter weight pigs in the barn to continue growing. And when we do that, there's several things that are occurring. And uh, Jake DeDecker at, at Illinois did probably what I think is, is one of the first published studies uh, looking at marketing events and how it impacts performance. But we're really doing several things. We're providing more pen resources, right? So we give those pigs more feeder space, more floor space, more water space. The other thing that, that happens is we're altering that social hierarchy, right? You're taking the dominant animals out and, uh, and you're, you're kind of reshuffling that social order in the pen. And when you think about the, the distribution of weights in the pen, you're also cleaving that heaviest tail and, and adjusting that, uh, that distribution of, of weights in, in, the, in the environment. So a lot of things going on. Uh, so there's a lot to keep in mind. Um, you know, again, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna present some data on a model and, and I think it's very wise when people said models are never right, but some are less wrong than others. So let's keep that in context as we move forward. But these are the things that we have to worry about. And I had, a, I had a gentleman tell me one time that it didn't matter if producer A and producer B provided the same floor space, they were gonna get different responses based on other environmental factors uh, in the facilities. And so, you know, there, there's really a need to understand some of these other environmental factors that could potentially influence or interact with floor, floor space as well. You know, one thing is group size. How many pigs are present in the pen? Uh, feeder space, water space, flooring type, as, as Mike discussed a little bit. There's been some work looking at, at genetics and how genetics uh, affect the response of the pig to different space uh, allocations. Uh, temperature is one. We just got through one of the uh, pretty hot summer in the last five or six years, and, and how does that impact that animal's need for, uh, for space? And then also gender. So all of these things are things that try to keep in mind and look at and understand how do those environmental factors impact that animal's response to space? And so if you put all this together and you think about it, um, like I did, I, I got a pretty big headache. And I said, well, this is, a, this is gonna be a, a fool's game. I don't know if I'm ever gonna get an answer out of it. But what happens is, if you're a university professor, you find a grad student that, that you can dump this project on, and so that's what happened to me. So this is what I've thought about for about the last, the last two years of my PhD career was a lot of these factors. So what we decided to do was to go back to the literature um, and, and start to begin to pull together as much information as we could about published research looking at the impact of floor space on finishing pig performance and also studies that evaluated uh, floor space effects after pigs were removed from the pen. 
So uh, we, we collected all of this information. We tried to pull together uh, information on study length, initial, final body weight, uh, feeder space, water space, group size, and floor type, so that we could try to account for these factors as we started to develop a prediction equation. Some of the things, uh, one thing that we did statistically, I'm not going to go through the statistics today. I think it's pretty cool, but um, Mike doesn't, so we, we decided not to bore you with the statistics. Uh, but one thing that we did do is we only accepted papers that reported uh, variance estimates around those treatment means. And what we did with that was we used that as a weighting factor in our uh, prediction model in order to uh, infer more information from studies that had less variance around their error or around their treatment means compared to other studies. The other thing that we did was we did not uh, incorporate any papers uh, from, from studies conducted in, in Wien to Finnish Barns. Uh, Dr. Walter uh, did quite a bit of this work in the early 2000s, uh, but most of those studies looked at uh, space allocations uh, early on after weaning, uh, so, it, so we felt like uh, they didn't really fit the mold of a lot of the other reported, uh, reported data looking at solely finishing pigs. And so in total, the database that we looked at had 30 different papers uh, reporting uh, results from 40 experiments. Our experimental units for average daily gain was uh, 112, and then 107 uh, experimental units for feed intake and feed efficiency. And those, those publications or those papers ranged in age from the early 80s uh, to 2014. So about 30 years worth of data we tried to pull together uh, for this uh, uh, analysis. So really the variables that we looked at trying to incorporate or, or uh, bringing to the model to see if they improved predictability or, or, or predicted gain responses to space included K, that Mike already talked about, the K value, uh, floor space itself, study length, initial body weight, final body weight, uh, feeder space, which at the time of all these papers that we gathered information on, uh, what we found is that a lot of people, well, most, most authors publish data based on the number of pigs per feeder hold, which looking back, it's a little bit of a crude measurement of feeder space, right? And so that's something in the future, as researchers, I, 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 I try to tell everybody, make sure that you report all of this information associated with feeder space, feeder type, so we can understand and quantify what, the, what that feeder quality was. Uh, water space, group size, floor type, and gender. Again, trying to account for as, as many variables as we could from the, from the literature. Ultimately, uh, after days and days and days of running stats and, and, and making some decisions and moving forward with model development, we ended up with three, uh, three uh, prediction equations. The first one looking at average daily gain. Uh, the variables that were important and improved the predictability of, of the pig's response to space included K, a quadratic K term, initial body weight, final body weight, and then a K by initial body weight interaction. So really, if you think about this, what it's saying is that across the data, as you increase your K value, you're increasing that pig's performance, but at a diminishing return, right? So over time, once you get to a certain K value, you kind of, you plateau, and there's no value uh, to, to adding space beyond that point. But it also shows that, that body weight is an important factor in predicting that pig's performance. And if you think about case calculation, it incorporates final body weight in its value, but it doesn't incorporate initial body weight. So this, it makes sense that that factor would be uh, important or useful in predicting uh, that pig's response or performance to space. Similar predictor variables for feed intake. And then for uh, gain of feed or, or feed efficiency, uh, we, we were able to take the predicted gain, the predicted feed intake, and fit our database incredibly well with that information uh, generating a predicted uh, feed efficiency. So if we look at a few examples, uh, here we've got a graph with uh, three space allocations for pigs from 55 to 175 pounds. 
and on the right, pigs from 175 to 285 pounds. And if we look at their predicted average daily gain as we increase the amount of space provided from these equations, it says that early on, that pig's not really limited or uh, you don't see much of an improvement in performance with additional space from six and a half to seven and a half square feet. But if we look at late finishing, which is where we would expect to see a majority of that impact, we see that there's a much larger increase or improvement in performance as we provide more space to that animal. Feed intake, again, a very similar uh, response. And if you look at feed efficiency, um, what, our, what our work did and what it showed that a little bit different than what uh, Harold and Mike's work showed was that uh, we did see an improvement or a response in feed efficiency as we provided more space to that animal. So what we came up with or what we concluded that uh, we were able to, to put together a, a fairly robust database with 30 papers spanning the last 30 years. We were able to use a, a general linear mix model uh, to create these uh, prediction equations that incorporated or showed that increasing uh, gain in feed intake uh, with increasing K, but that came at a diminishing return, and that uh, initial and final body weight impacted that predicted uh, feed intake and gain of the animal. And then we were able to fit a feed efficiency uh, value to their respective database with, with uh, pretty, high, uh, pretty high accuracy. Now, the one thing that, that I, I, I really appreciated about the work that Mike did 10 years ago with the K-value paper was they actually measured the percent response uh, in gain. And so it was very easy to translate that data across a variety of herds, across health statuses, growth rates, different nutrition uh, uh, programs. And so we wanted to be able to also provide or, or allow for flexibility in what our prediction equations uh, uh, were, were, where they were able to fit. So to do that, what we actually did was incorporated a, a y-intercept adjustment. So essentially what we're doing is we're assuming that that space response is gonna be similar across herds, but from your own observed data, you can actually adjust that y-intercept to fit your herd performance. So I'll walk through a few examples. This is actually our, our uh, uh, spreadsheet calculator that's available at ksuswine.org. Um, over here in the, the dark yellow section is actually our adjustment observation entry. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to enter your initial and final body weight, your known floor space allowance, and your observed gain and in feed intake. And what that does is then it adjusts uh, the predicted growth performance variables to fit your farm performance. And so here, uh, the observed average daily gain was a 1.9 from 200 to 280 pounds. And if you look at uh, observation one here, at the same weight range, the same floor space, that predicted performance is the same at 1.9. So then from there, you can, you can look at emulating or, or look at how, as you change floor space, how that could potentially impact or, or, or affect uh, performance and gain, feed intake, and feed efficiency, and that percentage change um, of those response criteria. So how would you use this to emulate a, a marketing uh, event or strategy? So this is, uh, this is one where uh, you've got five, five data entry points where, where you can look at floor space estimates. And so here what we're, essentially what I'm doing here is taking a pen that initially started with a floor space allowance of 6.9 square feet, and we're removing two, three, four, or five pigs from the pen. And then as that uh, space allowance changes, we're estimating how much that will change the performance of the pigs that remain in the pen after you, uh, you remove those animals. And uh, the one thing that this does not do, and in this example, uh, what I'm not doing is I'm not accounting for that change in body weight of the pigs that remain after I remove pigs. So I'm gonna take the heaviest pigs out of the pen, relieve that floor space allowance, but the pigs that are left, their initial body weight will be lighter, right? So keep that in mind. Another example, if you wanted to emulate or look at multiple marketing strategies, um, and it's a little more work, you gotta, or you gotta do a little math, but you can essentially break those periods up and look at, uh, at, a, at a marketing event early, and then coming back and doing a marketing event late, 
pulling that information together and then looking at, okay, if I took a cut when the barn averaged 240 pounds and then another cut when they averaged 260 pounds, how would that impact my, my expected performance after those marketing events occur? So that kind of leads into the second part. We also did some work with Gene Gorley uh, in central Iowa and his research barn, looking and evaluating how marketing strategy and floor space uh, impacted uh, finishing pig performance. So in this study, we used uh, just under 1,100 pigs. Uh, we in the finish facility. Uh, we started them at 80 pounds of body weight and used them in a 117-day study. Uh, they were allotted to one of four experimental treatments. And we'll walk through these experimental treatments. The first was what we considered to be a positive control. We stocked pigs at 15 per pen and provided almost 10 square feet of space and those pigs remained in that pen until they reached 310 pounds or until they reached market. So no marketing events prior to complete removal of all the animals from the, from the population. Then we looked at uh, three other initial floor space treatments where we stocked pigs at seven square feet and we allotted those pigs to three different marketing strategies. The first one, which I'll call the 2-2-2 strategy, we took the two heaviest pigs from the population at three different points uh, in time. And these were actually, this treatment was developed to mimic uh, what Harold and Mike did with the K value. As that pen's average body weight approached that plateau, that was when we went in and we removed the two heaviest pigs to try to mimic if we could get the same performance as the positive control animals that were given all the space that, 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 that they needed. Uh, the third and the fourth were more what I would consider to be more commercially uh, uh, performed marketing strategies where uh, for three, the 2-4 strategy, we took the two heaviest pigs uh, when that pen averaged about 240 pounds and then the four heaviest pigs when they averaged 280 pounds. And then the fourth treatment, we had what I would call a one cut in a dump where we took the six heaviest pigs when the pen averaged 280 pounds. For uh, pens that we stocked at lighter uh, densities with 15 pigs per pen, one thing that we tried to do was to balance and equalize feeder space. So we did block one of those feeder holes to provide similar trough space as pigs that were uh, in pens with 21 animals. And in case of removals, the nice thing about Gene's barn is that we could move the front gates in as we had removals to keep floor space allocation intact until marketing events occurred. So that was one nice thing that we could do. And then we fed uh, corn soy diets with 20% distillers and 3% added fat. So a quick graphic to look at the marketing events. Okay, so this would be day of the study, and uh, here's the number of pigs that were removed from the treatment pens and the uh, an approximate percentage of the population. So for the 222 strategy, we looked at taking 10, 10, and 10% 10 of the population from the pen and then selling the entire pen. Uh, for the 24, we took 10% and 20% of the barn prior to selling the pen. And then for the, the six treatment or six strategy, we took 30% of the pen prior to dumping. So a quick graphic to look at the, the difference in space. Uh, these pigs are about 220 pounds. Uh, we can see 21 pigs per pen, a little less space and room compared to those stocked at 15. So if we look at the response to average daily gain, and I converted these to percentages, so I'm not gonna talk, talk any of the stats, keep it simple. Uh, but if we consider the positive control to be the 100% uh, the uh, performance or the fastest growing, we can see that from day zero to 64, which was the very first marketing event that occurred in the barn, we actually saw a reduction in gain for pigs initially stocked at seven square feet to, compared to almost 10 square feet. And then from day 64 to 76, once we removed those two heaviest pigs from the 222 marketing strategy, we actually saw performance return to a similar level of that of the pigs stocked at almost 10 square feet. Uh, the day 76 to 95, we actually had, I wouldn't have expected this, I, this could just be some variability in values, uh, but we, uh, we, we did not see performance improve as we removed pigs from the, the 222 and the 24 treatment as we expected. 
Um, but overall, I think what's interesting is that this last phase, so this last phase, uh, the last 12 days of the study, we we're looking at all pens that contained 15 pigs per pen. And we saw similar performance across those pens. If you look at feed intake, again, uh, we see some bumps or improvements as we remove pigs from the pen. And this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, you know, theoretically, you would expect performance or feed intake to increase to that of the positive control pigs. But in reality, you're removing the heaviest pigs from the pen and the, the highest intake pigs from the population, so we didn't see that. Uh, we saw it improve compared to pens without marketing events, but it never returned quite back to the positive control, which actually makes sense because we are changing the population dynamics as we remove the heaviest pigs. So if we look at overall performance, um, what we actually observed was a uh, pretty good decrease or pretty linear decrease as we changed either that initial floor space allowance or the marketing strategies that we performed. Pigs initially provided almost 10 square feet, grew faster than uh, pigs initially provided seven square feet and on the two, four or the six marketing strategy. And we did see an improvement or an intermediate performance for pigs on the 222 marketing strategy. So if we came in the barn earlier, we took pigs out sooner, the pigs that remained had better performance compared to if we left them in the barn and crowded them. Makes sense. If we look at feed intake, again, kind of as I discussed earlier, we actually did not see a difference in feed intake, uh, average daily feed intake across those pens based on marketing strategy. We just saw an impact based on that initial stocking density. If we look at feed efficiency, we actually saw a, uh, the, the pigs provided the most space in the barn, had the worst feed efficiency, and the pigs on the 222 marketing strategy had the, the, the best. Uh, this makes sense, right? We're taking the heaviest pigs out at lighter weights so the population is more efficient. Well, let's look at that, right? I, I, I sat up here and I said, well, come on, guys. I made all these nice fancy prediction equations and they say that, floor, or that feed efficiency gets better as I provide more space. Well, what's, what else is going on there, right? We know that as we provide pigs more space, they're growing faster. So if we look at the difference in final body weight across these treatments, those pigs were much heavier when they reached market weights or when they went to town compared to uh, the average weight of treatments uh, initially provided seven square feet and on the different marketing strategies. So if we look at, and everybody can, uh, can, can scrutinize or adjust these however you want to, but if you adjust that feed efficiency to try to account for those differences in final body weight, it actually looks more similar and it looks like we are reducing or, or worsening feed efficiency as we uh, get tighter and tighter on space on those animals. So those animals that were uh, stocked tight and marketed late had worse feed efficiencies to the same final body weight uh, compared to those that were marketed sooner. If we look at uh, the, the within pen variation across those treatments, as you would expect, as we begin to market pigs from those treatments, we're improving and reducing our coefficient of variation in the, the average pen weight. And so by the time we got to the final day of the study, uh, pigs uh, initially provided almost 10 square feet had higher coefficients of variations in pen weights compared to those where marketing events had occurred. Okay, if we look at the economic factors, right? This is really what's gonna drive whatever we do. If we look at total weight gain per pen, the biggest thing that we saw, and it's, it's not much of a surprise, but numerically, if I stock fewer pigs in my pen, my weight gain per pen is a lot less, right? But if I look at individual pig performance, it's much better. If we look at feed usage per pen, our feed usage is less when I stock fewer pigs, but per animal, I've got more total feed consumption. Now we did see some interesting numeric trends in mortality, but uh, there's quite a bit of variability, so uh, not much to infer from there. 
And if we take those economic drivers of feed usage per pen and weight gain per pen, and we incorporate a few assumptions on fixed yield, uh, diet cost, so this is roughly estimating $4 corn and $7 corn, which is a little high with today's markets, uh, fixed facility cost, and, uh, and uh, uh, two different uh, carcass prices, we actually utilized a uh, regression equation for premium and discounts associated with that base price, depending on, the, on that animal's carcass weight. But if we incorporate uh, those economic assumptions and look at the different, e or different uh, economic scenarios with uh, low revenue and low feed cost up to high revenue and high feed cost, the biggest thing which we'd expect, right, as we stock fewer pigs in the barn, our economic return or income over feed and facility costs is much less. But what's interesting is that in times where feed cost is high and revenue is low, it was more advantageous to remove pigs from the barn sooner and reduce total feed usage versus keeping the pigs in the barn and putting more weight on. And obviously, that's vice versa. When revenue is high and feed cost is low, we can see that it was actually more economically viable to keep pigs in the barn longer, put more total weight on them, and then sell them uh, at heavier weights. So really with that, um, you know, what we found was alleviating stocking density pressure by marketing pigs prior to removing or dumping the barn. Uh, it, it, it's obviously a helpful tool, right? That's why we all do it. Um, in this study, it appeared that the one or two marketing events uh, were the most economically viable, which makes sense that that second treatment, the 222 treatment, really it was kind of a validation point to understand uh, how Harold and Mike's equations, uh, how, how well they did or predicted that, that animals need. And then the one thing to consider, like Mike discussed earlier, is you've got to account for the additional labor and transport costs that come with additional marketing events uh, as you make these marketing plans and schedules uh, in your, uh, your operation.